<clears throat> Welcome to WBC Faster Together, the LinkedIn Live series of Women Business Collaborative. I'm Gwen Young, COO of WBC. Today, we continue to focus on companies of purpose, the workforce, and leadership. My co-host, WBC Advisory Council Champion, Linda Peak Shack, will be in conversation with award-winning former journalist and corporate CMO, Anne-Marie Squail, founder of Proofpoint Communications. The Women Business Collaborative is an unprecedented alliance of over 70 women's business organizations and hundreds of business leaders building a movement to achieve equal position, pay, and power for all women in business. We are mobilizing thousands to create momentum and accelerate the pace of change through collaboration, advocacy, action, and accountability. Our leadership is a diverse board of directors, advisory and leader councils that include more than 34% people of color. Check out our nine action initiatives in the chat and join our movement at wbcollaborative.org. And please sign up to attend our annual Action for Impact Summit, which takes place in five weeks. Each week in this series, we will explore different ways to advocate change by presenting data, research, and best practices, by showcasing the importance of cross-generational collaboration and the allyship of men in the movement, and by lifting up the power of women's voices for change. So Linda, let's get started. Thanks, Gwen. I am so glad to welcome today Anne-Marie Squayo. Anne-Marie has done it all. Her business journalism has won the Pulitzer Prize and the Loeb Award for her work with the Wall Street Journal. Her corporate CMO and communications work has been lauded by Forbes and PR Week, and she's the founder of Proofpoint Communications. She's here today to talk about her philosophy of companies of purpose, how to communicate and integrate purpose into corporate culture, as outlined in her Fast Company article, which, one, which was one of the 10 most read articles of the past year. Anne-Marie, welcome to WBC Faster Together. Thanks, Linda. It's great to be here. Well, before we dive into your article, which, by the way, is entitled Employee Engagement is Out, This is the New Goal, tell us why you wrote it, why and why you think it resonated with so many readers. Yeah, no, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, I think as a former journalist, I, in terms of communications marketing leader, I, I'm fueled by the importance of transparency, accountability, and dialogue. And, and I think that as I transitioned from journalism into the corporate world, I was kind of appalled uh, at how poor the communications was. I mean, and you know, granted this was about 15, 16 years ago, but um, I, I remember the first uh, time I, I looked at our intranet at when I became a vice president at Lockheed Martin, I got there, our intranet was horrible, right? We're, this is a business with like new leadership, new external challenges, you know, going through a reorg, layoff, all the stuff. And, and we had nothing on our intranet to communicate to employees. We ended up turning three months. I, I said to the team, like, we don't have time. Like, we got to get this done three months. Three months, we launched a brand new intranet that was completely news oriented. So it's not surprising that I would employ news tactics and employee communication. And then the results in our annual employee opinion survey were off the charts. Like despite all the things that were happening, the changes that were making people uncomfortable, they were uh, very informed and knowledgeable about the strategy. They would still recommend working at the company. And, and it was a real lesson to me on what is achievable if you really start being honest with your employees. And um, I mean, my experience working at some of, some of the companies I've been at is that is not an instinct that everyone defaults to. Well, you know, in your article, you quote a Netflix a corporate executive saying, once you get over 150 people, you need unity and connection. And that has to be created. You can't command it. 
one of the first things you suggest in your article is one way you create it is by nailing your narrative. And you say that leaders should capture their company's purpose in 30 seconds. Now, most people don't do that. So how do you help your clients? How do you uh, help other uh, team leaders do that? How? What advice do you give them to hone their communication so that they are advocating their purpose in short and simple ways? Yeah, and, and listen, I'm not going to say that we've gotten there. <laughs> um, I think it, it is definitely a work in progress. But frankly, I feel like if we could get a corporate leader or even a mid-level manager to uh, synopsize the strategy and the reason that the business exists in one slide, perhaps, perhaps like that would be a win, even if it wasn't 30 seconds. Um, but I think that, you know, listen, I'm a big advocate of having a strategy for story and a story for strategy. And, and I think that people remember stories. Um, you know, I, I can meet somebody again 10 years later, have no recollection of their name, but I will absolutely remember a story they told me. And I think that's true for many of us. And so turning your strategy, and that assumes you have one that can be articulated into something that's that's tied to a larger purpose and that can really be summed up in I sort of imagine these things as the your reason for being, right? Like so if if group point communications went away tomorrow, what would the world miss? Um and and I think that if we ask ourselves that question and we're somewhat honest, we can come up with those emotional connections that are going to fuel both employee engagement and inspiration, as well as client engagement, partner engagement. It, you know, it, it plays out on Wall Street. I mean, we're in the midst of this massive change um, in corporate life, right? Where corporations have had to take stands on, on political or societal issues that they had previously really tried to stay away from. Um, they are caring about stakeholders beyond just shareholders. Everybody needs that story. And they need to hear it pretty quickly, right? Because on any given day, we all have tens of thousands of messages bombarding us that we're maybe not even aware of. So if you want to catch somebody's attention and get them interested, you've got to be able to do it quickly and, and succinctly. Is there an example from one of your corporate experiences or from another company that you could give us that you think uh, a CEO and the leadership team did well? Yeah, you know, it was funny. When I was interviewing at Netflix, one of the things that I was told was, and and this, and I think it was, uh, let me say it, and then you can tell me what you think of it. But it basically was, we operate at the intersection of renegade and, rep, and reckless. We never want to be reckless, but we always want to be renegade. And and like, it truly in that 20 second in comment, I was like, oh, I get it. Like I completely get how the company thinks, what the strategy is to always be pushing the envelope, but not quite be reckless about how we do it. And, and I think that if companies spent more time, if leaders spent more time figuring out like what is the crux of what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve here, then they would have it, it's such an easier time. And when I think about positioning and messaging, Linda, I always start with the so what. Right. And it's a it's a carryover from my journalism days when people would call and pitch us stories and I would always feel like so what? Um, but but the so what is really the positioning, right? Why should the world pay attention to, to you and your message, your narrative? And then I go into sort of the macro environment, right? So like why are we having this conversation now? You told me that this is important, but why is it important right now? And why should I listen to you? And then we go into kind of the, why should I listen to you about it? Like, what's your differentiated position on this topic? And then what am I going to get out of it, right? So like someone, I, I once had an executive coach who always talked about the W-I-N-S, like what's in it for me. I forgot what it was. Anyway, I screwed that up. But anyway, the idea is what what is the customer getting out of it? And, or the employee or the shareholder, or the partner, right? It's the what's in it for me. Positioning, if you write those messages out against a big idea, like the so what, you probably have seven or eight sentences that you can then support with facts 
wherever necessary. And that is your 30 second elevator pitch. Now, I said it really quickly. It is not easy to do. But no, I know, I think, and it's, it's why we have so many generic messages that sound alike coming out of corporations, right? Yeah, and I just started working with a CEO who was like, everything sounds like corporate speak to me. And I was like, this is funny because you are like literally the CEO. And so, but, but in her words, I want, I don't want to sound like that. And I, I think that is the challenge for all of us, you know, as leaders, certainly as communicators, is to stop sounding like robots and actually start talking in ways that connect people, uh, give people excitement and emotion, and don't sound like, you know, somebody just like a robot wrote it. Yeah, well, that takes us to some of your other recommendations in your Fast Company piece. Your second one is start with trust. And I was fascinated with the example you gave, having coming out, having come out of the corporate world, that in a, that if you have trust, uh, there are many people who know what the quarterly earnings are going to be, but we rarely see someone trading on that information because there is trust. You've written about trust, how hard and how to tell who you can trust at work and how to build trust. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, I am a big believer in giving trust. Um, well, when you start with trust, people rarely want to squander it, right? I mean, I think that if you start the relationship off with, you'll have to earn my trust, um, that puts somebody in at a negative, right? How do I know when I've earned it? What do I have to do to earn it? Now I'm also like trying too hard, right? So it becomes an inauthentic experience and relationship. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a big believer in trust. I, I, my pain point on trust is that I am trusting and trustworthy, but I have had to find out the hard way that not everyone is like that. Um, but, you know, the, the Netflix example that you just gave about earnings is blew me away when I got there. You know, I'm in my first quarterly business review, and there's 300 people in the room, and we all know earnings. I'm like, what? Like, this is transformative. I'm like, how is nobody trading on this, right? And nobody ever did. And as I said in the article, you know, somebody finally did and they got put in jail. So, I mean, that that was the first time in, in years that anybody had ever break, broken faith. I mean, similarly, uh, when we were doing our global launch, which was we were going to do the final launch with 130 countries at one time, we were planning that for a year. It was like an company-wide, everybody knew what was happening. Big secret, a whole year, never leaked. Never As a former leaked. reporter, you know how, how very, very odd that is, right? I went to bed the night before the announcement like giddy. I was like, I cannot believe this didn't leak for a year. And what was most surprising to me is during that time, we had people leave the company. In some cases, you know, if you know anything about the Netflix culture, we're regularly, you know, letting people go that we don't think are, are delivering. We let people go all that year and none of them leaked it either. And I think That's that gets to trust. And when you have it, you want to keep it and, and respect. If you treat people with respect, even on their way out, they're not going to be trying to sink you. Um, and, and those things work in tandem, right? I mean, trust and respect are the crux of any great relationship, whether it's personal or professional. That's right. Well, let's go to your third point, And that is that you have to be inspiring. And, and you and I have lived through the time when charismatic leaders were in the news a lot. But you talk about this being much more than charisma. And I love your concept of, of recharging your inspiration battery. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess the whole world has certainly seen its share of bad leaders who uh, who are quite charismatic. Um, so and I don't think you have to be charismatic, by the way, to be a great leader. Um, in, in fact, I think it can be very authentic if you're shy and reserved and still be a great leader because people can, can see the real you in it. I mean, one thing I've always said to the, the leaders I've worked with and for is, you know, to lead, you have to have followers. To have followers, they have to trust you. To trust you, they have to know you. And so there is an importance there, I think, in kind of being 
honest about things. Now, I mean, I, I've talked about this in another article, right? Like, you know, it's not like you're going to tell me a whole bunch of personal stuff that I really don't want to know as a colleague or um, a manager, but but really being more open about who you are and where you came from, what motivates you, what you struggle with, those kinds of authentic conversations can really open the opportunity for others. When, when I was at um, Lockheed, uh, Marilyn Houston, who became the CEO, I mean, she was always so perfectly put together. And, and she shared with me one day that her, her story, which was that her father had died at a very early age and she had to put herself through college and grad school and work her way up the ranks or whatever. And you would literally never know this if you've ever seen Marilyn. And, and I said to her, we need to tell your story. And, and at first she didn't want to do it. And I said, but your story will inspire so many other people. So at our women's leadership forum at Lockheed, she got up on stage, we put a picture of her parents up, up, up there and she told her story and she was mobbed by her colleagues, women at the company afterwards, surrounded her, had no idea the adversity that she had had to overcome to get where she was. And I, I think that it was powerful. Um, and I mean, I practically teared up watching it and I knew what was coming. So I, I think that there's a level of this authenticity that you really have to put out there in order to build that trust with people. Um, and I, I think that setting your team up for success, I mean, talking about how you recharge your battery, I, I'm sure everybody on this line has had this problem, right? I mean, especially during the pandemic, there was really no time to recharge your battery. So we were all kind of dragging and running on empty. And, you, you know, I, I will say for even myself, like, I, I don't, I was definitely not my best self. Um, I mean, you cannot be your best self when you're exhausted and depleted. And and I think, you know, what Tawny Cran said in my article um, was really important, right? Like, if you are feeling it, and we know when we're feeling it, right? Like, you know it. You have got to pull back. And sometimes it's hard to do that. You know, there were times when I was trying to pull back and I could get pulled back in. But I was like, I, I just need one day. I just need the one day to, you know, but I think that this whole, the parameters have fallen aside over, I don't know, the last two decades or so where everybody's expectation is that we have to be on all the time. And I think that we're starting to hear this like term lately has been everywhere about quiet quitting, which seems to just mean that you're going to pull back so that you're not running on empty. And if that looks like quiet quitting, I mean, so be it. But I think that at the end of the day, we are all personally responsible for knowing when our, you know, when your laptop is, is draining on its battery, you plug it in, right? And so we yeah. are all personally responsible to know what that little battery signal looks like for us right now. If you're on 10%, it is time to pull back. And that, that may just be a couple of hours, right? You may just leave the office or your work office or whatever for three hours and go get your nails done or go for a hike do whatever it takes to reset internally and that nobody can do this for you right well I mean, and you know you talk about modeling that behavior in your next recommendation to emphasize well-being yours and theirs right and i think what you're urging is two things to use your personal story to inspire and to model that behavior of recharging uh and and the examples you use are great uh we we i don't want to run out of time on your recommendation so the next one is create growth opportunities and i love some of the examples that you have used in your corporate life can you talk a little bit about how you gave growth opportunities in support of the company's purpose yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was interesting. I was doing some research for a client the other day, and I, I tripped over this LinkedIn, um, their global talent trends report uh, from this year for 2022. And the number one way to improve your culture is professional development opportunities. 59%, I believe, of the people who fit the survey. And for them, you know, they're using all the data on LinkedIn as well. So it's good that I can plug them since we're here on LinkedIn Live. But um, 59% said professional development opportunities. So 
I mean, it's interesting. When I got into corporate life, I really started thinking as a manager. I really started thinking about how do you, how do you develop talent? It turned out to be something I really love. I love helping young people reach their goals, but I also really help taking somebody who might be a little stuck in their career and figuring out where what's your next great move, right? You don't have to be stuck in this job. And so I'm a big believer in you either play to your strengths or we stretch you in a new direction. Um, and and which of the two do we want to do? And those are not those are conversations that you have with people. I had this young woman she was probably two years out of college when I started at Lockheed and she was incredible, but she didn't really even know how incredible she was. And at one point we had this really challenging program, this ship program with the Navy that had a lot of issues. And I said, you're, you know, you're going to probably take the lead on this program as a communications person. And she was like, no, 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 I am not ready. I'm like, yeah, you are. And she did it and she knocked it out of the park. And she has continued to make me incredibly proud uh, many years later, watching her evolve her strengths, you know, start a family and still juggle career and all of that. And I, I think that we, that, that's probably the most fulfilling part of these jobs is trying to figure out how to, how to develop people. I, I think one of the things that's interesting to me, Linda, is that sometimes you run across managers who think who either think that people are indispensable, so I can't let them move on to another job or whatever, or they think we're all dispensable and I can replace you tomorrow if you don't want to keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, neither is true. None of That's us is fine. indispensable or dispensable. And I think that the, the real challenge and beauty of being a great leader is understanding that, right? Like you've got to let your best people go and grow and and you'll find someone else right you know maybe there's somebody better it just it just takes a little effort to look for them that's right and that leads us to your final evolve the culture and we'll just close by uh by saying that one of the things that you emphasize is that culture change starts at the top and you've given us such great examples of how culture uh cultures of purpose can be developed and i want to thank you so much for all these practical rec recommendations that I hope our audience can use right away. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are interested, we have dropped the Fast Company article into the chat. And if you want to know more about Anne Marie, you can go to her company, Proofpoint Communications. Thank you so much, Anne Marie. Thank you, Linda. This was great. And Gwen, what's on tap for next week? Thank you, Linda. Yeah, we're really excited because next week we're talking with Patrice Duramo and Deepti Sharma about pathways in the tech industry. So I think we're going to be having some of these similar conversations, but taking our learnings from this week. Thank you all for joining us. We invite you to wbcollaborative.org to learn more about WBC's initiatives to increase women in the C-suite and in the boardroom, to address underrepresentation of women and access to capital in certain industries, and to advance a pipeline of women leaders to bring gender pay parity and diversity, equity, inclusion to the business landscape. And don't forget to register for our upcoming Action for Impact Summit, where we will talk more extensively about corporate purpose with over 15 companies dedicated to improving corporate purpose, impact, and employee well-being. Have a great Thursday, everybody, and we are truly faster together. <laughs>